Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we are talking all about pests and how I personally managed to stay on top of pests with my quite large orchid collection. Now, I do want in this video to give you a little bit of a full picture on the subject because some of you might not yet have a pretty big collection, but you would like to have one. I will tell you a little bit of the realities of handling so many orchids when it comes to pest control. So I decided to split this video in what makes controlling pests in a large collection quite different than in a small collection. Second, I will show you my current techniques. Third, I'm gonna tell you about the things that I don't use or the things that I've used and didn't really work on a big collection and why. And finally, four, I will touch base on what actually happens in nature and why our environments are just so different and they kind of need to be handled differently. So with that said, I hope you'll enjoy today's video and don't forget to give this video a like if you end up enjoying it and why not subscribe, I post three times a week. So with that said, let's just start. First off, trying to maintain a large orchid collection pest-free 100% is impossible. Staying on top of pests is also a much different story than if you only have 10-20 orchids. And you might suspect what the problems might be. But personally, I didn't really expect these differences to be so impactful. So much so that it actually dictates the way I am actually handling pests. First off, of course, we have the time issue. Maintaining each orchid clean of pests implies actually spraying or actively at least checking the orchid from time to time. So let's presume we have a pest infestation in our 10 orchid collection. And let's say you would have to invest in each orchid two minutes of your time. This means picking the orchid up from its place, taking it to the sink or the tub or outside, wherever you spray, actually spraying every nook and cranny of the orchid. And also I will include here the time that it takes you to prepare the solution. You might have to prepare multiple solutions. So I would say an average of two minutes per orchid sounds about right. If you have 10 orchids, you will be done with spraying them in 20 minutes. If you have 20 orchids, you'll be done in 40 minutes. And now imagine you have 100 orchids. You will be done in approximately 200 minutes, which means almost three hours. I personally have 450 orchids. And if you calculate how much it will take me to spray every single orchid, then you're gonna end up with a lot of time invested in these orchids. Not to mention that if we want to stay on top of pests, we will usually require multiple sprayings a few days apart. Well, sometimes it takes so long to spray orchids that we just don't meet that deadline in which we need to spray again. Some treatments require multiple sprayings or daily sprayings, depending what we're going for. So one problem is time. And I'm not gonna factor in all of the other chores or life duties that each of us has. Then comes the physical effort. Most probably if you're a home grower, you wouldn't want to spray water together with other solutions on your furniture or on your walls. So you will take the orchid, bring it in the bathroom or the kitchen or even outside on your balcony and you will spray the entirety of the orchid there. Well, if you have 10 orchids, it's not really a huge deal to move around the orchids and get the job done. But again, if you have a hundred plus orchids, that really, really takes a toll on your body. And again, I'm not gonna factor in maybe some mobility issues some people might have. I have pretty big issues with my back. Whenever I have to move orchids around, I will admit I don't have a good time, so I try to do it as less as possible. So second problem posed by a big collection is the physical effort involved. And the third major difference, the more orchid you have, the more solution you will need to spray all of them. And this can pose an issue if you are purchasing the solutions rather than making them yourselves. There is a lot of product you need to buy, a lot of money you need to invest. So most of the times people who have big collections do tend to search for DIY solutions or solutions which are overall more economical. Sometimes we don't find these solutions at the store, so we do need to opt for DIY solutions. So I wanted to start with this idea because it is the basis of the full picture. And trust me when I say that, I personally was not expecting pest management to be so, so incredibly demanding. Because the thing is, insects will always make their way into our collections. 
they are a natural part of the outside world and especially if you live in an area which has a garden or has vegetation through your window even through the net or on your clothes pest will find a way to reach your collection and being that most of us grow our orchids in a room be it a living room or a designated area we cannot replicate fully all of the processes that happen in nature, which we'll talk about a little later in the video. So expect pest issues and expect the solutions to not work the same for you as they would do for a person with a much smaller collection. So with that said, now I'm gonna show you the two, let's say techniques that I still use and I find they fit me the best. First off, my paraffin oil technique, and I do actually have a separate video about this. Check it down below for more information how to prepare the solution. Many of you already know it. I do like to prepare an oily solution, mix paraffin oil with water and a little dish soap, and doze down my orchids. What this does is deposit a very, very thin layer of oil on orchids. Oil happens to be my preferred active ingredient when it comes to pests because it doesn't really make the difference between mites and insects. It also acts mechanically, so pests cannot really develop any type of resistance to it. Maybe if they start to develop gills, but I don't think that will happen anytime soon. Now, this recipe is actually based on a product that exists on the market. It is the horticultural oils, which some of you who are lucky can actually find at stores. It just so happens that I cannot find anything like that in my region. Also, I have so, so many orchids that I would have to buy a lot of product. And something like this actually saves me a lot of money and a lot of waste at the end of the day. So I do prefer to do it myself. I have a recipe. It's not my original creation. I just tried to make a DIY version of horticultural oils based on paraffin. Now, this technique I typically use on orchids which are large or have a lot of foliage, such as oncidiums and anything that requires a very fluid application rather than patchwork, as it were. The major downside of this solution, like many, many, many other solutions we prepare, is that it contains water. And sadly, when we grow orchids in our living rooms, potted, upright, especially in the case of Phalaenopsis, we are risking exposing the orchid to rotting issues. And I have to say that even I, after so many years of experience, managed to do a mistake last year and spray orchids way too late in the season. And the temperatures were a little too low for that water to evaporate, hence I crown rotted quite a few of my Phalaenopsis. Now, monopodial orchids, usually the ones that have crowns, are more prone to this type of rot especially if the season is wrong and especially if grown upright rather than on their side how they would naturally grow so I personally like to do this type of treatment either in full summer either on on cidiums and orchids that don't have crowns or don't have new growths currently growing new growths of sympodial orchids can get rotted as well if we're not careful so I do reserve this treatment that works so so well for me to the warmer months but what do we do in winter? Because pests don't really take breaks. Well, enter the second technique that I currently use. Some of you guys might know it already. I like to use leaf shine products based on paraffin oil. The principle is the same. This product creates a film on top of the leaf, which is thin enough to still let the orchid breathe. It also evaporates pretty fast because it's not a heavy oil. It's much, much lighter than vegetable oils like canola, sunflower, or even neem oil. So it doesn't tend to linger way too much on plants. And it really acts in the same way as this solution. The major pro of this product is that it doesn't contain water. It only contains oil and alcohol since it's an aerosol. So the chances of me crown rotting or stem rotting orchids are much, much lower with this product. However, there are major, major risks in using this as well. So because I don't have a separate video for this, I'm gonna show you now how I use it. First of all, when we spray the product, not only oil will come out, but also alcohol. And because it evaporates super fast, it also cools a lot. And if you spray a little bit on your finger, you will see how cool this liquid is. So first and foremost, this stuff should never be sprayed very close to the plant. 
because the soft tissue can be affected by that alcohol and by the temperature of the alcohol. So first of all, the way I spray it is from a distance, maybe about 30 centimeters away from the plant. And I will not press down and hold it pressed. I will do very quick presses, very quick pumps. Let's see. Like this. And I already have a very, very small coating on the crown. This little layer of oil is enough to completely, completely smother any type of bad insect. It is not enough to actually damage spiders, which I am trying to promote in my grow room. I do have a few, but not enough to control pests. It really isn't enough to harm them. Whenever I see them on my plants, I just put them on a different plant that I'm not gonna spray. But overall, I didn't have issues with harming my spiders with this thing. But things like thrips, mealybugs, spider mites, which are a nuisance, scale, all of them are super, super pretty exposed to being damaged by this oil. Now, this I typically use on monopodial orchids, such as Phalaenopsis and a few others. And I do use it on the undersides as well, but again, being very, very careful that I don't overdo it. That's all I need pretty much for this orchid, depending on the pest I'm dealing with. If there are spider mites, I will do everything. If there are thrips, I might just do the top because they're only attracted to the freshest, let's say, tissue. I will also do flower spikes and buds, not so much flowers, but this allows me to treat my orchids and any flare up I might have during winter time. And I can do so only to the orchids that are affected. Pretty much I can spot treat. And I will have to say this, which typically takes care of the overall little infestation that I might have coupled with this, that takes care of the flare ups and does not promote rotting. I am almost pest free. It's impossible to be pest free, but I am having such a good handle on my pests, particularly because I don't need to take a hundred orchids outside, dose them down. I typically do this in the greenhouse when I have all the windows open. If I have a lot of orchids to spray, I will take them out because I have some birds. But if I just do a pump because I saw something, I don't usually do it. It doesn't really release too much product in the air. It's just a pump or two. When it comes to leaf shine and oils in general, there is only one type of orchid or plant which I'm a little nervous about. And this is the velvet leafed plant, such as the jewel orchids. This is a Ludicia, this is a Makotis. These guys react a little bit differently. They can actually react pretty bad because they don't have a thick protective cuticle, that shiny membrane that most orchids have. And this makes the plant more prone to actually absorbing the oil. This being said, for the purpose of testing and for the purpose of, I really, really don't have time to deal with this right now. I feel like the world is crashing over me. I went ahead and sprayed. This one was sprayed totally at some point. It had a lot of thrips and I have to say, they didn't react all that bad. But I would definitely be super careful with any type of oil, whether you purchase it or prepare it yourself when it comes to velvet leaf plants. If you have no choice and decide to try it out, do make sure that the layer of oil is very, very thin. I usually go very, very high up and do one of these puffs. As you can see, there is something deposited on the plant, but not enough to create any type of sheen. I don't even see it much. And that actually works because the insects are so, so tiny, they will be affected, but the plant will also absorb that oil. So you don't want to put a lot of oil on the plant, better let the plant absorb it or let the oil evaporate. And then in a few days, again, repeat the process, then just dosing the plant, getting rid of the insect, but also of the plant. You don't want to do that. So this is the only type of plant I myself am a little nervous about and I would rather just keep these separately or maybe sheltered in a way and not have to deal with piss. But if I must, I personally will use something like this just very, very, very carefully. And as I was saying, flowers. I don't typically spray flowers because chances are they will get destroyed by the oil since they don't have that leaf cuticle to protect them and they do absorb the oil. However, sometimes there are those pests which simply attack the flowers so badly that, you know, the flower is compromised anyway, might as well experiment. 
And well, I do actually spray flowers as well because it's where I can personally see thrips better. And if I go in manually, they're just so fast and so tiny that most of them evade me before I actually do anything. So I just get my leaf shine, spray a little bit the flower. And the flower you see is a Cattleya flower that I sprayed yesterday. And today, look at it, no more oil, it absorbed it, but it looks absolutely fine. And the thrips, yeah, they're still here, but trust me, they're not alive anymore. They're not moving, they're not doing anything. Yep, they're gone. And I managed to get all of them in one pump. So I'm not saying you can actually spray flowers. I'm saying if some of your flowers are already compromised due to the heavy infestation of mealybugs or whatever, what do you have to lose, right? <laughs> Might as well spray them. Because the alternative is to cut away the flower spikes so you limit spreading, so you're gonna lose the flower anyway. Might as well try to save it and enjoy it for a few more days while getting rid of pests, right? One thing that I also appreciate with this little thing that I found is mobility. Let's say that I have a vine, a vanilla vine or some other house plant, and right now I'm thinking of Summer Rain Oaks. When she had her millibug infestation on her pothos, I do believe it was, she took everything down and that was a few meters long plant. She took everything down, went to the shower with it. I can only imagine the trouble. Well, with this thing, all you need to do is go to the place where you see the millibug or the family, mealybugs have a bad reputation of actually making babies really fast and you will see a lot of very tiny white spots. Getting all of them manually can take an eternity. You just go to the point of the vine and just do, and that's it, problem solved. So I really do enjoy the fact that I can be mobile with something like this. This is how I actually managed to contain a really bad thrip infestation on my Phalaenopsis, which affected the crowns, especially my mini Phalaenopsis. You will see when they will be in bloom, they have really, really bad looking crowns, but I managed to completely, completely get rid of thrips using the spray and not crown rotting any of them, which is super awesome. However, before we move on, I do wanna put this out there. Whenever you see people using whatever type of product, whether it's a commercial product or a DIY solution, please, please, no matter how much you like that creator, please don't go ahead and spray all of your collection of plants with that product. And this is not because we wanna harm your plants or anything, but products can differ so, so much from region to region. Leaf shine can be of multiple types. Some of you guys said that there are some leaf shines based on wax. I really don't know how those work. Also, if you've never used a product until you get some experience and a good handle on it, you might do mistakes. So the best thing to do whenever you feel like trying something, just try on a leaf, on a plant, just do some tests on a very, very tiny scale to see how your plants react and how the product works. Observe your plant for two to four weeks and see if it responds well to the treatment. Sometimes it might end up bad and instead of you losing the entire plant, it's always better to lose only one leaf. So do please keep that in mind. It's great to test out stuff, but be very, very, very cautious. I don't want you guys to lose any of your orchids because I'm using this product. All right, so now let's talk about why I don't use certain products, which maybe are popular, maybe other people use. This will tie in a little bit with the first part of this video. So first of all, there are products which I've already used in the past and I found that they're not as efficient or as fast as I would like them to be in order to allow me to have control over my entire orchid collection. For example, neem oil, which is a crowd favorite. I personally don't find it efficient for me quite at all. And I've tried to use it multiple times over the years. And yes, I did go for the thick, gloopy, cold press solution that has azadirectin. I think that's what it's called. Not only does it smell really, really, really bad, and I personally cannot stomach it well, I made an effort for my plants and used it, but I found that it was way too thick to be used as a mechanical substance and in the way of actually affecting insects, I found that it really didn't do anything even over multiple applications. The way that I managed to validate my finding was using a digital microscope, which I actually have a video on, check it down below. It's a really useful thing. 
I was able to see that the spider mites were up to no good, basically like nothing ever happened from the neem oil. This doesn't mean neem oil is bad, it can actually work as a mechanical solution, but being that it's thick and gloopy, it will not make a very uniform film on the orchid. The more you have time to insist on the same orchid, the better results you will have. If you don't have time to insist, the results will just not be so good because it's not as efficient as other types of thinner oils, like mineral oils. So for me, that is a no-no, mainly due to the size of my collection. And over the years, I did also try all sorts of other things, other types of oils, like canola oil, which was good, but a little bit too gloopy for my taste. And some sensitive orchids really didn't react all that well because it doesn't really evaporate as fast as paraffin oil. This summer, I also tried a pyrethrin solution, which many people recommended, and I personally wasn't very happy with the results. Again, it wasn't doing enough in a decent amount of time to allow me to be on top of pests. So many, many solutions on the market I have already tried and they're not efficient for me, mainly due to the size of my collection. So you can find yourself in a position of not being able to benefit from these solutions like other people benefit, just because you have too many orchids and too little time to spare. Second type of solutions or products are those which are simply not available for me. When it comes to organic products, there is quite a big issue with imports. Many sellers actually don't send these products to other territories, not even in the same economic region. On Amazon, there are many products that I'm simply incapable of acquiring because they don't send to my region. I just happen to live on an island as well, so transport is all the more difficult. There are some products which will simply deteriorate way too much on transport. And here I will include the predatory mites, which is another option which many more lucky people have at their disposal. I could never get my hands on something like this anytime soon. I don't find them locally. They will not make the transport and I'm not sure if anybody is willing to send them to my location. I usually like to go with things that I can find locally, but again, the availability of products in my area is limited as well and it's completely different to many other people's locations. So being that I also do videos, I try to rely more on things that I can DIY, things that people can DIY themselves as well. So that plays a part in my choice of products as well. And third, products that I simply don't wanna use out of principle. And many of you already know, I don't use toxic substances with my orchids. Since I grow them in this room, I spend some time in this room and I also have some birds I really don't wanna expose anybody to substances that can damage their health. Also applying these substances is a little hazardous. I'm not okay with taking all of those precautions just to spray 400 orchids. It's a principle, it doesn't make me feel comfortable. I will not use those substances, but I'm not saying they're bad, I'm just saying other people use them I don't. Another product that fits into this category is the Atomaceous Earth, which again makes me feel very, very uncomfortable. It is a dust that can become airborne, especially in a plant room, especially if we're using fans, and I do use fans, because I believe that if it has the potential to really damage insects, being that it's very, very sharp, I fear that it could also have the potential to damage my lungs and my bird's lungs and whoever comes into this room. Now, whenever I talk about this, some of you guys say that it's perfectly safe because it is food grade. But there is a very big difference between being food grade and edible and being inhalable. If it's food grade, it means it can reach your stomach. What I'm talking about is inhaling it into your lungs, which is a totally different story. And there are many products on the market which are perfectly safe to eat, but not safe to inhale, such as cinnamon. And I don't have to tell you why cinnamon is really, really not okay to inhale. But of course, this is what I fear. I am not a scientist. I did not create this product. So if you have any doubts, better ask the manufacturer, better ask for reassurance that it's okay, even if you inhale it and things of the sorts. I'm not the one to ask, but this is something that I fear. And I know that I would not sleep well at night. So that's why I don't use it. So pretty much, my choice of products is a combination of the things that I have available, things that work fast for me so that I don't have to literally destroy my body spraying all of my orchids, 
and things that I am okay using from a principal standpoint. But how do plants seem to grow in some sort of harmony outdoors? Why doesn't this harmony translate into our growing rooms? Well, because our rooms will never be nature. Now, even these pests, as I was saying, they're a natural occurrence. They do participate in the natural balance of things. And they also have things that keep them in manageable numbers, such as rain. The simple fact that we shower an orchid is enough to eliminate part of the population of pests, which I have a funny suspicion is what we actually see when we use certain products and we see a decrease in the pest number and we think, oh, the product worked. Sometimes it's just about the fact that you're dosing the orchid or whatever plant with water. So rain is one of the things nature uses to maintain numbers in check. Also natural predators of these insects they exist in nature, they can be very, very different, they can be different depending on location, and also the mere seasonal change. Some territories have so harsh winters that no pest survives. Their eggs can survive, or some of them, but in this way, part of that population is eliminated by natural phenomena, really. So expecting to do such a good job with pests as nature does is a little bit too harsh on ourselves. You should not expect to never have pest issues because the truth is they exist, they will find their way into your growing room and you have only yourself to help you in the battle against them. So don't be hard on yourself, don't be scared and upset about pests, we all go through them, focus on solutions. As a side note, the orchids that I grow outside in the warmer months, being the cattleyas, the vandas, and a few other heat-tolerant plants, they tend to have less pests than the plants that I have in my plant room, because outside there is a whole world of potential insects and other stuff that help me out. So typically what happens is when I bring my orchids inside for the winter, they come in cleaner than I put them out. And this exact thing happened with the thrift infestation that I had. They didn't really attack cattleyas, but they attacked the flowers. Put my orchids outside, they're absolutely clean now without actually me doing anything, simply because I put them outside. This will not happen to everybody, it just happened to work that way for me. So maybe this is yet another way of trying to control numbers by growing some of your orchids outside whenever you can. The bottom line is, the more orchids you have, the more chances you have to find that some treatments which work for some people will not necessarily work as great for you. You have to keep in mind that fatigue comes into play, the money you spend, your attention level. When you have 10 orchids, you can actually devote your full attention to them and you will not lose interest. Try to spray 50 orchids a day and trust me, you will lose interest, you will become frustrated and you will do mistakes, you will miss corners, you will miss undersides and things of the sorts. So all of these things are okay, they're normal, they're human. Don't feel bad about it because there are solutions. And these are my solutions. I hope they will help you out if you decide to try them, if you've ever been in a position of saying, why doesn't this thing that everybody loves work for me? I've been there, I'm constantly there. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and really I hope you will stay on top of pests and not sweat it whenever you see a little millibug. It's gonna become a common occurrence, which is not a bad thing. Uh, but yeah, that's the truth. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Hope you'll have a great day. Subscribe to my channel for more orchid videos, tutorials, experiments, updates, and other fun orchid subjects. If you wish to support the channel, do consider becoming a member or visit the merch store linked down below in the description. You can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook. It's always nice to stay in touch there as well. And I'll see you next time. Bye.